Jonathan Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with uh, former members of the U.S. intelligence community. And today we have another fascinating story. Um, our guest today is a retired FBI officer and author who's uh, written a brand new book on really a devastating topic that he will describe to you in uh, detail. Um, Ralph Hope is a uh, street FBI officer. He spent many years of his career uh, working the streets of the United States. Uh, and only not after 9-11 did he ex accept some uh, overseas assignments. Um, most prominently, he was the uh, deputy legal attaché um, in the Baltic states and the legal attaché um, in West Africa. And then shortly after retirement, he was a, a liaison representative to the United Nations peacekeeping force that were fighting Islamic terrorists in Mali. Um, please welcome Ralph Hope. Hello, Jim. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Ralph, you've got a new book coming out. Uh, I just had the pleasure of reading it. Um, it's a riveting and, frankly, somewhat unsettling topic. In your author's note, you say, um, I'm not really a historian. Uh, what got you started on this project? Well, Jim, the book, of course, is titled The Gray Men. And uh, what got me started uh, was, as an investigator for many years, um, I'm used to asking questions. and. I had a question uh, during my uh, assignments in the Baltics uh, when I would uh, frequently visit Germany. And uh, my question was, what happened to the 100,000 members of the Stasi that were around when the wall came down? And I was surprised at the answer that I received when I asked this uh, from people who should know. And I mean, uh, Germans, uh, other Europeans that were experts um, or the average German, um, the answer was either embarrassed silence or a look that I would describe as quiet desperation. And nobody really wanted to talk about it or they said they didn't know. So that question remained and I wanted an answer. That's where this book came from. Ralph, uh, can you please tell us who Hubertus Knabe was? Um and the memorial that he created and, and the role that he played in this fascinating story. Well, uh, Jim, I know many of uh, your viewers are very familiar with uh, the, uh, the Stasi and what uh, they did in Germany and outside of Germany as well. The, the time um, of following the wall falling and then in uh, Germany being united in 1990 was a period that many people were hopeful, especially in Germany. Robertus Knob, a, a German who was born a free man by happenstance, as his parents took a great deal of risk crossing over, coincidentally, shortly before the wall was built. And it was still risky to cross. And they, they took a risk. Uh, his mother was pregnant with him. He was born a free man. But he decided to become a historian, and he then uh, was put in a situation where he had uh, experiences with the Stasi himself when he crossed into East Berlin. And when the wall came down, he was one of the hopeful ones. Um, he was the one that, that, that thought, okay, there, there are, there are going to be, there's going to be a reckoning. He, like most of his generation, had seen many former Nazis in uh, following uh, World War II prosper in Germany and avoid a reckoning. And so he thought this time, this time there'll be a reckoning. And he was disappointed. And he decided to speak up and to speak up frequently. And he ended up in a position that he had a platform to speak. And he has spent the last 30 years doing that and battling attacks from former Stasi officers. And uh, he continues to do that to this day. Ralph, why were um, former MFS officers so successful in creating a series of protection mechanisms and avoiding um, investigation and prosecution. And why were pensions for former MFS officers so high and compensation for victims of the MFS so low? Well, those are all very good questions. Very good questions. And I asked many of those myself um, uh, when I was writing this book. The short answer is there were many investigations of the Stasi officers, but there were very, very few prosecutions, and even fewer convictions. Only one out of 90 plus thousand uh, Stasi uh, 
officers at, at the end of the Cold War in 1990, there was only one who actually served jail time for something he did as, a, as an officer. And there were 400,000 Germans victimized two generations. And they were able to do that to a large degree uh, because the relatively onerous privacy restrictions that were rolled out in Germany in the 90s. Germans and Europeans, like many people that had had back-to-back -back dictatorships, they wanted to have privacy in their lives, very understandable. So they enacted these laws, which the former Stasi officers promptly seized on to hide behind and effectively to victimize their victims once again. And that has continued. It's ironic that the laws designed to protect the new Germany were instead used by these former Stasi officers frequently to silence victims from speaking. Ralph, the name uh, Vladimir Putin is very well known to us today, but what was Putin's role in these events? And how did he promote former Stasi officers after the fall of the UDR? Well, Putin, of course, had his first tour as a KGB officer in Dresden. And the people there that remember at the time, he was uh, kind of a small uh, guy, but he had a strength. That was he spoke fluent German. And he happened to be uh, during uh, the when the wall was starting to tumble and Germans were basically invading Stasi offices. They got emboldened when they found out that they, weren't, they wouldn't be shot. And in Dresden, this happened as well. And a group of, uh, of citizens basically stormed the Stasi office in Dresden, which basically had very few people there, and they were surprised that nobody stopped them. So a small group came out of the door from that building and decided to go to a building across the street, a pale yellow house that everybody knew in Dresden it was where the KGB was headquartered. And they went over there and demanded there was one guard. They demanded to be let in. The guard went inside and came out with a small officer dressed as in the Soviet uh, uh, uniform who told them in German that they had weapons and they would shoot if they tried to come in. The crowd dispersed. That small officer was Vladimir Putin. And he, during his time uh, in uh, East Germany, developed very strong bonds with many of the uh, Stasi officers that he worked with. In fact, surprisingly enough, in 2018, an interesting discovery was made at the Dresden Stasi offices in a file folder that had been overlooked. And that was Putin's Stasi identification card, which I have a photo of it in my book. He then helped people, former Stasi officers, become prominent in the Russian energy machine. And we fast forward to today, and one of his very, a very close friend and former uh, Stasi officer, Matthias Warnick, uh, remains close to Putin and remains uh, in a part of the uh, Russian energy uh, machine and actually uh, was very instrumental in getting the pipeline approved, which has put Europe on the hook and dependent on Russia for energy currently. I mean, that's just an amazing to me. What are some other examples, um, some of the most egregious examples of rehabilitated MFS, MFS officers landing on their feet and uh, doing quite well? Well, of course, some ended up in politics. Some ended up in business. They mostly were able to gloss over or deny their background. It wasn't uh, except for... If you worked in federal uh, level politics in Germany, there was a way they would vet a candidate to make sure they hadn't been a Stasi officer. But virtually in all of these jobs, there would be, in, at least in Germany, uh, there might be a block on the application if it had anything to do with government to say, I certify you know, I've never worked as, as a Stasi officer. And they all, of course, checked yes. But frequently it would found out that it was not, in fact, true. A whole... Uh, section of the Stasi, the uh, HVA, which is their foreign, was their foreign intelligence arm. That's the arm that was, uh, that was run by Marcus Wolf, famous uh, uh, man without a face. Uh, when the wall came down, they had been shredding documents for some time. Uh, a surprising fact is that they continued to shred after that. And when the uh, committee uh, was, in, was there trying to sort out the records, the place was still filled with Stasi officers and helpful that they said they were trying to be helpful to avoid uh, their sources from being killed uh, in America or something. And in reality, one of the things they were doing is shredding all of their own personnel files. And so they felt very com comfortable at the, the, that the HVA, the Foreign Intelligence Zone, that they 
could do whatever they wanted in New Germany because their files were shredded. That would have been true. It should have been the case, but they made a mistake, and that was there was a separate file that they had no way normally of knowing existed. That file identified every one of those officers, and it was it was found later. Um, and it was something used just by their file people to index uh, records. And so that then has sim- sim- uh, since caused an issue if the right people ask and try to find out. But in most companies in Europe, and even the United States, um, if somebody came out of Germany during that period of time, they weren't asked the uncomfortable question because many companies and governments didn't want to know the answer. Um, and so there were many, uh, you know, and I, I, I profile a number of these officers in my book, but that's only the tip of the iceberg. And I think uh, as an investigator, I thought of the obvious thing that would and should have been done to quickly determine if there was or going to be a problem with somebody who had been a st- who worked as a Stasi officer and is now in a position of trust. Um, and that was merely to compare the list of Stasi officers electronically to uh, employment roles and highlight which you know may be in a position. You know, maybe it's not always a problem that somebody was a former Stasi officer, um, but if they're in a position dealing with victims, like many ended up in the, in the, in Germany, and uh, they were dealing with victims later, the victims were clueless as to who they were dealing with. Um, if they were in government, maybe that's something that should be known. But that was never done in Germany, probably because of the privacy laws and probably because the German government, especially the German government, really didn't. They were nervous because a lot of information was missing about a lot of people, and it could have easily been used uh, for in a lot of different ways. And so it was better as a German uh, Stasi expert told, told me, it's Better not to ask questions, but asking questions was always my business. And so I continued to ask them. Good for you. Um, Changing topics just slightly. Who was Professor Murder and what did he create? Yeah, Jim, Professor Murder is a uh, one of the chapters in my book. It's about an individual called called Hans Stelzer. He was a career uh, Stasi officer who uh, started the the Stasi forensic program, their famous program where they could take a typewriter and identify, you know, pre-internet days, you know, who had written something or had, uh, you know, for a a whole host of forensic uh, topics. He became very well known in Europe as a forensic expert. And he, in fact, was an undercover Stasi officer working uh, as a, a head of the forensic sciences unit at Humboldt University, which is the East German actually the oldest uh, university in Germany, but the East German University. And so he was, it wasn't until after uh, the uh, the wall fell and Germany unified when it was discovered that he had been an undercover Stasi officer for his entire career, basically getting two paychecks. And uh, one of his last projects that he did um, was a uh, project that was called Toxdat. Toxdat is basically a database of ways to kill somebody with uh, science. And he was given that project by his uh, uh, by the Stasi, and he reported uh, at a high level, uh, and he f- completed it uh, in uh, shortly before the events of 1989. Um, and it includes things like using radiation, to kill somebody, which when you read it, uh, read it now, it seems uh, very, um, it, it reminds us of what actually has happened in the recent past. That whole database is still uh, kept secret by the German government. It's, it's part of the Stasi archives, but it's one of the few things that nobody is allowed to see. And I asked, and so, I, and it's, it's, uh, it's considered to be still very sensitive, and this is so many years later. Stelzer, uh, then, when it was discovered what he had written, and that was published in the, in the media, uh, everybody he was named Professor Murder because of that. And uh, so, he, 
he became one of the uh, relatively high-level Stasi uh, officers who by then also was earning a pension in New Germany. And he decided he had to do something else. Well, he'd been trained also as a lawyer. Um, and one of the unknown provisions of the reunification agreement, or one of the lesser known, I should say, is that if you were a lawyer in East Germany, um, then you could become a lawyer in unified Germany kind of by filling out a form. There were many lawyers trained by the Stasi. They were trained at the Stasi University in Potsdam. He was one of them. Uh, however, they weren't trained to represent clients. They were trained uh, on the matters that the Stasi uh, want, uh, wanted to use them to protect the state. But all of them, including Stelzer, automatically became able to practice law in New Germany. Well, uh, he found that he, that was nice, but he didn't remember anything about law because he had been in forensic uh, science, but he couldn't do forensic science because now he was known for being Professor Murder. So he reinvented himself as a protector of uh, uh, financial uh, security for uh, people and companies. And he, he started a couple of companies where basically he uh, would ensure that they were being that people could get protections from financial uh, um, uh, risk from dealing with unsavory people. It's kind of very ironic. Um, and he became quite uh, well known in this. And he uh, uh, he was doing quite well again. Um, he uh, he died kind of mysteriously in Berlin. Um, and uh, in the, uh, uh, I think, 2006, thereabouts. Um, and his cause of death is, is not, cannot be located, and nobody knows where he's buried. So it's another one of the little mysteries, the uh, mysteries within a mystery that you find in dealing with this topic. Even today, people know, if you mention Professor Murder, they, they will recognize that. They may not know his real name. They may not remember his real name, but they, they recognize that. Did the uh, memorial that uh, Kanabe helped to create, did it finally um, receive formal German uh, recognition? And then why was Kanabe summarily dismissed at the end? Well, uh, Herbert Kanab was um, initially worked at the Stasi archives, and he was the chief historian, the first historian. I think he was probably the first uh, uh may have been the actual first German to request their own Stasi file. And he had a Stasi file, and, and that's mentioned in the book. Um, but he started asking a lot of questions and doing a lot of projects at the Stasi archive that made a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, and uh, they would start calling him things behind his back, like Stasi Hunter. And uh, who did, you know, they thought, who does he think he is? He should be a quiet historian. Well, when he saw that the Stasi archives were still filled with former Stasi members when he got there and that uh, uh, there were a lot more former Stasi uh, uh, officers still there, even years later, even now, there are still a few Stasi people still there. Um, he started to spoke up again and again. And, and uh, the Stasi uh, Organizations that formed uh, in the 90s and are still active now um, would complain. And uh, so a solution had to be found. And the solution was in 2000, they had a, the old Stasi prison in Berlin, uh, Hoschenhausen, was a, a museum that nobody visited, basically, because it was on the edge of town. It, it wasn't very, uh, uh, hadn't been uh, prepared that much for visitors. Um, and uh, so they said, well, we'll make Herbertus Kanab the director, and, and that might solve our problem. And so they offered it to him, and he jumped at the chance. And everybody was relieved at first, because there he'd be over at that, uh, the uh, museum, and he has no Stasi files over there. So what could he do? Well, the first thing he, that he decided uh, was that it wasn't going to be a museum after all at all. He was going to make it into a memorial, uh, a living memorial of, of, of very active and engaged with the, the people today and students. So he fixed it up exactly the way it was when the Stasi had left. And uh, he um, 
uh, also uh, had uh, hired uh, former inmates to give tours. And uh, as a result, a, a couple of years later, uh, the number of visitors went up about 10 times. And then it continued to increase. And by 2015 or 16, I believe that it was the most visited Cold War memorial in Europe. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, and a result of his own writings, uh, one of which is a book he wrote, a German written German, but in the English title is "The Perpetrators Among Us," where he out and so he continued to agitate these groups. And uh, in 2000, so they were looking. There was a target on his back, so to speak. In 2018, he came into work. Uh, uh, well, I should say prior to that. He had a new idea in 2017 was to create a separate center, a broader center for left wing extremism and, and house it within the memorial. And he had actually gotten Angela Merkel to uh, get funding and he was proceeding with that. And I think that was the last straw. In 2018, he came into work one day and he received a call um, uh, saying that uh, there had been a uh, sexual harassment complaint made against his deputy that worked at the memorial. And uh, that had, there had been an uh, anonymous letter received. And uh, he asked to see the letter. And they said, the, uh, the supervising uh, member from parliament, who uh, uh, was from the left party at that time, told him, you don't need to see the letter. Um, and he asked again, and they said, no, you don't need to see the letter. So after two days, he thought, well, I better suspend the, he suspended the deputy. The next day, he was fired because they said he had taken too long to respond. So most people in Germany see the writing on the wall. They know this was a clear what had happened. Um, he was a guy who, and he, 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 who continued to speak out, and he now, he still speaks out, um, but uh, he... Uh, lived 30 years with this hanging over his head and he continued to fight so he he's a commendable character ralph in the final chapters of your book you bring us forward to the present day what conclusions have you drawn about um, far left uh, parties uh, in germany in, in europe and elsewhere well you know if there's a problem in germany Europe and, frankly, the United States, too, with historical revisionism and trying to make something horrible seem not horrible. And uh, in Germany, uh, many of many people told me that it's not safe to criticize the left right now. It's easy and it's acceptable and even embraced to criticize the Nazi period, because that's safe. But if they do that and they uh, criticize communism in Germany, people, there are a lot of people that will rise up and complain and uh, there'll be anonymous threats made. And we're talking in 2018, 2019, you know, 30 years past. Um, the, uh, so the, 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 the left party in Germany is legally the same party as the uh, SED Communist Party. They changed their names a couple of times. Um, but the European wide left party um, is uh, um, is also increasing in prominence. There's an, an and uh, the uh, there's it's almost acceptable that uh, uh, people will try. They'll try to silence uh, people for speaking about uh, that communism was bad. I mean, that's like just that simple statement, which seems to be common sense, um, will attract a lot of antagonism and uh, things that will make somebody's life uh, difficult. And, and so uh, there's been a hushing of speech. You know, and I think globally we've seen that in other places as well. Um, I, I touch on that at the latter parts of the book, and I also touch upon um, how uh, the Stasi would have been in the 21st century, the, the Stasi of the 21st century. And 
uh, a lot of the things that the Stasi officers told me that they would have adapted to, they would have used. These are all things that you see now, particularly in China. And, uh, but it all starts with hushing speech. And, you know, and, uh, you know, I asked informally, I asked kind of off the record, some fairly high level Germans, what they would say to the young person today. Um, if, you know, and then their statement was to, to be very wary of anyone or any group, any organization that tries to control speech or tries to alter historical reality by making one extreme group on one side be bad and the other one not so bad um, or misunderstood. And, uh, and to, they say that uh, be cautious of somebody who will tell you that only one way is the right way. And uh, so, I mean, if you look at what's being done in around the world and Americans should be concerned as well, but you look at what China is doing, and these are exactly things that the Stasi would have been doing now, except they're using technology. The Chinese are, are have, uh, you know, are, are creating uh, uh, social scores for uh, their citizens. So uh, that uh, if, uh, they're collecting so much information on somebody. So it, within in China, you they can tell, you know, have you been criti critical of the government and social media? Um, perhaps they can tell, you know, have you been near uh, too many of the wrong government buildings? Have you applied it for travel? All that will go into creating a social score, which is what they're uh, they're aiming for, and that is something that would have been uh, extremely useful to the Stasi. And uh, technology now makes it possible for many people, not only government organizations, but other organizations to, to do things in such a way like an electronic uh, uh, Stasi globally. It's, it's much simpler now. And uh, it would have been uh, much more simple for the Stasi of today had they survived. And I had a Stasi officer tell me that Hey, we would have, we would have adapted very easily. Uh, this technology would have been very useful. And uh, instead of having 120 uh, kilometers of paper files, they could they could and have embarrassed many people since. It would be computer files that could be with a flick of the wrist could be shredded. Um, so um, it's it's important, I think, to keep focused on the present day. And this book ultimately is a book about the present. The book is called The Gray Men by Ralph Hope. It comes out in June and I highly recommend it. I want to thank uh, Ralph for giving us his time today. And I'm sure that our audience will really enjoy both viewing uh, this interview and also reading the book. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Ralph.